welcome so much. Uh, a warm welcome to the next plenary session of the International Conference on Sustainable Development. We are thrilled to have Dr. Raj Shah, president of the Rockefeller Foundation with us today. Over to you, Jeff, to start the session. Thanks very much. Good to be back uh, in, in the plenary and uh, really great to be with uh, Raj Shah, who was one of the great global leaders in sustainable development and has seen these challenges from every perspective. Uh, he now leads uh, this great and historic foundation, which probably has done more than any other institution uh, in, in the world uh, uh, to address the range of challenges of disease, hunger, science, uh, and uh, many, many other uh, great challenges. Uh, but he's also seen this as a senior US government official, as a administrator of USAID. He has been a, a leader in the Gates Foundation. He's been a leader in the private sector. He's seen it all. Um, so I'm really looking forward uh, to the conversation. Most important of all, uh, Rasha and I uh, both come from Detroit. So this is, uh, uh, th th this is a very key point. Raj, thank you so much for joining. I know everybody is uh, thrilled that you're uh, participating and, and uh, will shed uh, uh, a lot of light on uh, what we ought to be doing to achieve the sustainable development goals in the Paris Agreement. You and I have been speaking uh, intensively in, in recent weeks about uh, the vaccines, you're participating in uh, President Biden's summit uh, tomorrow at the White House, uh, and you could tell us about that also. Uh, and we've been discussing all of the financial issues. I know you've been playing a huge role in things like the new SDR allocation uh, and helping the IMF to uh, really reach the uh, uh, urgent uh, challenges. And we had Kristalina on uh, earlier today uh, oh, talking good. about that as well. So Raj, thank you for joining. Uh, and uh, uh, we're looking forward to some opening remarks and then uh, some conversation. Well, thank you, Jeff. And it is great to be with you and with the community of leaders at the ICSD. I, I will say uh, Jeff and I are both from Detroit and, and every now and then we get to see each other at a conference in Detroit that's called our homecoming conference. <laughs> and it, it's basically Steve Ballmer, Jeff and I, and a few others, and then a bunch of Motown stars. And, uh, and you can imagine who they ask to perform and who they don't. But, uh, but it's a treat to be with you, Jeff. And, and you are, of course, uh, we all look to you for continued leadership of the global development mission and the basic idea that the world can come together and do big, bold things. And so I'm thrilled to be with, uh, with this group today. Of course, the General Assembly Week, uh, you know, brings us all to New York and, uh, and is also a homecoming. It's a homecoming of our whole community and a chance to assess where we are against the mission we laid out for ourselves, most uh, specifically in the Sustainable Development Goals. And I, I think uh, this particular homecoming feels very significant. It's, it's uh, abundantly clear at this point that COVID-19 is the gravest crisis we've faced on a global basis since World War II. Uh, we've seen it uh, take 4.6 million, that's probably an undercount lives, uh, and we've seen it create this massive potential divergence in the global economy where countries with the resources, the political will, and the access to technologies like vaccines to overcome COVID-19 are able to imagine an accelerated recovery and able to invest in the response in a manner that's appropriate for the scale of the challenge. Wealthy nations have spent 24% of GDP fighting COVID and its effects on their economy, while developing countries have spent 2% of GDP in the same context, and even large emerging markets together have spent only 6%. So, when we look at that, uh, it really does feel like we're currently discussing a response to a crisis that is overdue and uh, dealing with the joint challenge of pursuing a meaningful, equitable, and sustainable economic recovery and needing to overcome the huge inequity in response on vaccinations in particular. Uh, as you've spoken about and written so much about, Jeff, the Africa's vaccination rate hovers between four and 6%. Uh, 
the numbers out of India are, are pretty unclear, but they're probably between 30 and 50% in terms of fully vaccinated. Latin America is probably in between that. And our, our analysts at the Rockefeller Foundation believe that new variants of concern are more than four times more likely to emerge from developing countries than developed ones simply as a result of that discrepancy. And the, the, the real thing I wanted to highlight for this community of leaders who care so much about the fight for global development and for broad equity and justice is that in fact, in the light of this crisis, while institutions and leaders have truly, I think, done their best with the tools at their disposal, the net effect of that in terms of a coordinated global development response has unfortunately been underwhelming. Last year, the world spent 160 billion in ODA. That's maybe three to 4% higher than normal. Uh, you know, it's a small increase. The multilateral development banking system has similarly had an increase in outlays, but far less than what they did in terms of a delta against the prior year when you compare it to their response to the global financial crisis of 2008. And the vaccine and uh, infrastructures around global health, which we've all been a part of setting up over the last two decades and nurturing and fighting for, have essentially uh, created a situation where you have every country in it and out there for themselves in terms of trying to ac access vaccine supply where they can. Uh, and Gavi and COVAX working to fill the gaps and supplement that situation. And it's still not clear that the global community has really committed to a 70% vaccination goal by the middle of next year. It's a goal that should easily be able to be set. And frankly, we think the supply base exists to produce about a, a billion doses a month. So it's a goal that should be able to be met under a lot of different circumstances. I think Jeff, your analysis, ours at Rockefeller, the IMF analysis, all basically say you need about $50 billion to go after that uh, goal with real intention and capacity. And we have somewhere around a quarter of those resources committed. So it was in this context, uh, frankly, and this will be my final opening comment, that I, uh, together with some colleagues, uh, worked on this idea of a COVID charter. You know, during World War II, leaders came together and created the Atlantic uh, Charter, and they did it. Uh, frankly, I learned a lot about how they did it. They did it uh, before they had won the war. It very much was Roosevelt and Churchill uh, together thinking about, if we win this war, let's be bold enough to do the things that would prevent the next one. And it reminded me of something I used to hear from the White House a lot when I served in the Obama administration, that in fact, a crisis is sort of the only time you have an opportunity to be bold in your aspirations. And so even though I think we're struggling right now to be bold in the context of the response to COVID-19 and the upcoming current fight against climate change, uh, I believe the world needs to embrace that kind of courage and embrace a COVID charter. And I laid out five core components of what that COVID charter might include. The first is a 1% of GDP commitment from industrial nations to global cooperation and development initiatives. We can debate uh, why, why that number, but, uh, but it would amount to an increase of about $350 billion, which I think is actually quite achievable in the current context relative to what we've spent uh, already fighting the current crisis. And given the tremendous economic consequence of new variants undermining the recovery in wealthy nations. Second, we asked uh, for developing countries to achieve a 25% milestone of domestic revenue collection and expenditures uh, based in large part on Jeff's own analysis that in fact, if that number stays around 14%, you'll never get the SDGs achieved and you'd need double that just to have a chance. And, and that feels uh, like a reasonable target. The third component is truly reinvigorating the Brenton Woods architecture. You know, we have great institutions we rely on that create opportunities for leverage, that have the ability, as the IMF has now done, uh, to step in during moments of crisis and create massive infusions of liquidity. But they were designed 80 years ago, and they need to be reconceptualized for the world we live in. They need to be uh, invested in, again, for the fight we're facing, both on COVID and on climate. 
uh, and we need to give them a chance to represent our new global interests, which are far more interconnected and far more focused on big transnational threats like pandemics and, and climate change. Uh, and fourth, we should have within this architecture more room for true public-private initiatives. I've been working on these for a long time, as has Jeff, but the reality is some of our biggest gains have been on childhood immunization, on HIV AIDS, on malaria. All of those have been public-private. If we're going to make the energy transition happen and happen in a way that we create half a billion jobs in the new energy economy of the future in countries that have significant populations that are constrained in their growth by energy access, we need to come together in a public-private collaboration to achieve that goal. And I could go on and on about food systems and land use and agriculture, and almost any challenge we face requires the combination of science and technology that only public-private partnerships can deliver. And fifth and finally, I think this new architecture needs uh, new political accountability. I think whether it's the G8 or the G20 or more likely the UN Security Council, development leaders, uh, Iran, USAID, uh, but, but the leaders of multilateral institutions uh, both need to be accountable for their performance to, those in, to that larger political enterprise, and they need the political backing that comes with that accountability in order for them to make change happen in their institutions. And maybe until we embrace that concept, um, I think it's it's hard to run institutions that have been doing something similarly for, for decades and decades and decades. So I, I share all that here because uh, while this is a tough homecoming for those of us in global development, uh, ICSD is all about being optimistic for the future. And I really believe that it is moments of crisis that unlock the bravery and courage to prevent this from happening again. It's the felt experience of knowing someone who has lost their life to COVID-19 or, or seeing the immediate natural disasters that are linked to a changing climate that should give us the resolve to aspire to do more. And we just have to get this done uh, now with real urgency. So I will leave it at that. I can think of no better setting in which to make the case for bold action than a setting convened by Dr. Jeffrey Sachs. And Happy to hear your reactions, Jeff, and, and talk further. Raj, uh, thanks so much. Uh, first, my reaction is this is a great uh, idea, a great uh, charter, a great list of uh, the components. And I think uh, you know, one, and, and uh, also very fitting for you and for Rockefeller Foundation, which uh, also has this history of great ideas, very, very big ones. You know, what all of this points to, and I think uh, this is an absolutely core part, of, we all have the feeling, whether it's vaccines, whether it's solar panels, uh, whether uh, it is uh, <coughs> online, digital, uh, telemedicine, or many other things, we have the feeling, you know, we have the tools uh, to, to actually get this done. We could get the vaccines done. We can uh, make the energy transformation the practicalities of the what to do have been wonderfully engineered in so many ways. They've been tested. They've been uh, uh, given uh, their, their uh, laps uh, around the track. But then we always come back to financing. Uh, how do we pay for it? I was uh, with the a finance minister uh, just a few hours ago from one of Africa's largest countries saying, Professor Sachs, it's fine. You know, we can't even afford primary education much less secondary education. I said, I promise I'm gonna help you uh, to close that financing gap. And this question then of how to steer the global resources to these rather modest needs, because the scale is also important for us to understand. And Raj, let me just put uh, uh, some numbers uh, on the table quickly for people to understand. At this snapshot moment, we're lucky. The, the world economy is basically a round number. It's $100 trillion. So that makes things uh, relatively easy. 1% of world output is $1 trillion, therefore. And half of that is in the advanced economy. So $500 billion. When you say 1% of GDP from the rich countries, that's $500 billion. Currently, they're giving 0.3% of 1%. So that's 150 billion. That's the extra 350 billion that you mentioned. That would be a great start. 
because in addition to putting more on the table, you could leverage that with your category four. There's so much private money, it's unbelievable. Uh, and uh, you know, both just the capital markets that are buying up the bonds of the rich countries at basically zero interest rates, 30 year negative interest rates in the case of Germany, 1% nominal in the case of the United States with inflation uh, of uh, at least that. So real interest rates, uh, basically zero. And there's so much private wealth. And it's interesting, uh, John D. Rockefeller was the richest person in the world uh, when the Rockefeller Foundation uh, was started. Uh, he gave the money to New York State, a billion dollar endowment, I believe, in 1913. Um, and today we have 2,700 billionaires with together whose net worth is, uh, I'd say, 15 trillion uh, as of today. Uh, and, and it's interesting, you know, we've, uh, we've we both worked uh, and you worked very closely with Bill Gates. We both worked with Bill to help set up Gavi and the Global Fund and other great initiatives at the beginning. One person, wealthy, but one person made a profound difference. That's and we have a couple thousand uh, that have the means to make a profound difference. So it seems to me that uh, your message and this core point that uh, it, the charter is really all around saying, let's put our money where our mouths are, where our goals are, where our needs are. And it just doesn't add up to, uh, you know, an un, a, a devastatingly large uh, budget that's going to break anybody's bank. It's just modest to have a decent world. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. I, I do think, let me unpack a few things you said because I want to react to that. The first is on philanthropy. I, I'm a little bit, uh, this is a terrible thing for the president of the Rockefeller Foundation to say. I get skeptical about philanthropy. And here's why. You know, uh, America's billionaires net wealth has gone up 62% since COVID started. Yep. Uh, the Giving Pledge, which is a global enterprise, and thanks to Bill and Melinda and Warren Buffett, uh, billionaires from around the world have committed to give away their wealth. Before COVID-19, their wealth was growing 11% a year, and, uh, and they were nowhere near meeting their pledges of giving away half their wealth. In fact, every year that went by, they were getting much farther away from that objective. And, uh, and so I, I am a believer in philanthropy. Uh, you know, okay. Obviously I am, but I just don't, but it's frustrating. Think, I, I don't think leadership <laughs> comes from philanthropy at, on, in terms of at scale global financing. I think that has to come from the public sector, but yep. when it comes from heads of state now, it needs to be reimagined. You know, I think Churchill and Roosevelt agreed to the Atlantic charter while, while literally on a boat. Uh, reading and discussing poetry about courage and bravery in 1941. Yep. The reality is right now, you know, on our boat, if we're talking about courage and bravery, we would, we would reimagine the global cooperation architecture. We'd invest in it at the levels you and I are talking about, and we would create a role for private wealth and private investment to be fundamentally a part of that picture. I, I agree with that completely. And, and there's, it's still too hard. I mean, even Rockefeller struggles, but if you're a new philanthropist, you can't work with the World Bank. I mean, you can't, I mean, they might say, come give us money for a trust fund or something, but there's no real construct of shared public private in terms of getting the leverage we need to get, uh, take advantage of the markets the way you articulated uh, is necessary. So I think leadership has to come from the public sector. Second, I actually think uh, something you said on the first part of comment is so important. The tools and technologies either exist or they can quickly be brought into existence. You know, our big project is building a global energy alliance to help unlock growth and upward mobility for the billion people who live. And they're consuming less than 150 kilowatt hours a year of energy around the world. I mean, that's no energy consumption. That's a light bulb. It's a light and bulb. It's exactly. a light bulb. And so, so uh, how are you going to solve and, that? And, well, and, it's, right. it's and think about technology. Trying to make, 
think about trying to make a livelihood without electricity, which is what uh, we're condemning a billion people to, yeah. uh, in effect, uh, uh, the only point of business. That, but, but I do think we have all this great technology, take stationary storage or, or uh, lithium ion batteries, but they will all go into an EV marketplace for wealthier countries if we don't do the types of things we did with Gavi in the early days and create supply chains and financial incentives and markets that make those technologies available in low-income country settings. And, and we have projects in rural Bihar, for example, that need lithium-ion storage. And we're competing with Tesla, you know, that obviously is a higher margin uh, buyer of those batteries for technology and for, for limited supply. So I, I just think we've got to come together. It's, it's a little bit like the vaccine situation. Yeah, uh, exactly. Pe pe people need a little bit, can't get it, can't get yeah. into the queue, uh, and can't get the financing for it in an organized way. But uh, correct me if I'm wrong, within, within a year or two, we could basically ensure electrification on solar Yes. mainly on solar and uh, and digital access for every person in the world with the, a modest amount of financing available uh, yeah, and we, get that piece done. And then you build on that. Once you're connected, yeah. once you have electricity, you can do a heck of a lot of things, healthcare, education, jobs, livelihoods, agricultural production, reducing food losses, you name it. Absolutely. In fact, this morning, our team at Rockefeller published a, a report together with Sustainable Energy for All and IRENA uh, at the UN that showed that in 63 countries that house much of the world's energy poor populations, if you got them connected to productive power and renewable electrification, most of that will end up being solar and distributed. You would create, you could create up to half a billion new jobs by unlocking the potential of productive energy in agriculture, in food processing, in small and medium enterprise, in medium to heavy industry in these communities. And it's a it's such a no brainer to get that done. Uh, it would cost about $130 billion a year for 10 years. Uh, but those investments of course would pay uh, tremendous dividends in lifting the living standards and the economic participation of more than a billion people. Uh, so, but these are the kinds of things we should be able to imagine. I just believe until we embrace some sort of a learning from this current COVID experience, I've called it a COVID charter, you call it anything, but it's just the recognition that in fact, you know, we are all connected and the right way to lift up and include everybody in a global economy is not sending your military to Afghanistan for two decades but rather you know, embracing the opportunity for development cooperation and joining the fight to fight climate change together and doing it with this point of view and perspective. I will hand deliver the report uh, tomorrow uh, to the chairperson of the African Union. Oh, uh, good, thank when you. When I meet with him, uh, it, because it's absolutely the most pertinent point. And, and I think it, uh, you made another point that is really important. Uh, even if much of this was uh, debt financed at, at low interest rates, because the world interest rates are low, uh, but even if it were debt financed, the fact of the matter is the returns on these investments are so large that they repay so many times over. And the people that say are given access to electrification and uh, some appliances at essentially no cost for the first several years <clears throat> would be able to become regular customers uh, later on. And, and the point is, we also need to rethink, therefore, the whole financing, taking note. You, if you're super conservative, no, no, we couldn't, that country's too poor for this. They're never going to get out of the poverty trap. Impossible. Uh, whereas if we understand uh, even some low interest loans, but over the longer term, then they reap the, the returns that your report indicates. And the debt itself becomes sustainable uh, because the economy has expanded so much. We have to change the mindset for everybody that this is the time for the breakthrough in access to these absolutely core technologies whether it's the digital, whether it's the green, uh, whether it is uh, basic public transport, 
certainly making sure every kid's in school using digital for health and so forth. This, uh, I think that is uh, uh, what, what the charter could accomplish. Well, you know, look, I, I think that would be a tremendous accomplishment if that's true and if it happens. I, I think the other piece of this is develop, development in general and developing economies specifically need to see the climate transition as an on-ramp for job creation and economic inclusion. And, you know, John Kerry has said repeatedly that 45% of the world's GDP is sitting out the agreement to be at one and a half degrees Celsius. And, uh, and the reality is that's just not going to get it done. And so most of those countries are, in fact, developing countries that say, look, we didn't contribute to this problem. We need a development pathway that lifts up our people first and foremost. And I think we in the development community have to just do a better job of showing how the fight against climate change is, in fact, going to be that development pathway that creates jobs. Our report indicated 25 million of those half a billion jobs could be direct from uh, putting in place renewable energy projects, but the rest are all what's enabled in different sectors of the economy and different types of firms and businesses. And I just think this is the opportunity we look at. We got to get this right. Glasgow has to be about development as much as it is as it's about climate. Uh, it has to be, yeah, development as much as it's about climate. And you and the ICSD community have the chance to, you know, make that happen. Well. We're going to carry the COVID charter forward. We're not uh, uh, quite uh, on, uh, uh, on on a warship in the North Atlantic, though it feels that way these days sometimes. Uh, uh, but we're going to absolutely to take this uh, uh, direction of uh, bolstering finances now for the most urgent needs, get this done. Yes, have a new uh, post Bretton Woods architecture. I've sometimes called it, uh, instead of Bretton Woods 2, a Bali 1, because next year the G20 will be in Indonesia. We're going to together use that opportunity. Raj, let me thank you for your leadership uh, and your vision, uh, which is extraordinary, and uh, for pointing us uh, so firmly and clearly in the direction of solutions. There's a whole uh, chat of people asking questions and uh, thanking you and uh, which I uh, convey uh, for all our on all our behalf we will follow up congratulations have a very productive week and have a great uh, uh, day tomorrow at uh, President Biden's summit where you're playing a leading role uh, and let's uh, get that vaccine coverage uh, done uh, as you've called for we'll do our best thanks Jeff, thanks for so your much. leadership talk, talk bye -bye. to you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. And